Thank you, Brother Steve. Good to have you back home. Amen. Also want to say thank you to Brother Kevin. Where's he at? Way in the back there, for filling in for Brother Steve while he was gone. And I'm going to let you just remain seated this morning for time's sake, and I want to share with you about the greatest gift ever given to man. Good morning. Merry Christmas. So I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads real quickly and let us go to the Lord in prayer again. Father, we just come before you right now to thank you that, Lord, we were once prodigal sons and daughters. To thank you, Lord Jesus, that you reached out as the great shepherd to touch each and every one of our hearts, to draw us to your Son. While we were yet sinners, you went to the cross for us, died for us. You suffered every sin and pain and sickness and heartache and death that this world has ever known on the cross. And Lord, we come this morning to worship you, not only with our song and our offerings, Lord, but God, just to offer up our hearts before your word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him and for him. And so, Father, we just lift our hearts up to you. We ask that as we prepare to celebrate this Christmas season, that, God, you would just write your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, your cleansing, your healing on our hearts and on our minds. Lord, the only peace this world will ever know is a peace that's found in you and the relationship with you until, Lord, this world is no more and a new heavens and a new earth come. And then you will be the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. But until that day, we thank you for the earnest of the inheritance. We thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. He draws us ever onward toward you toward your image and likeness, and ultimately toward home. And for that, we thank you, Father. And we ask your blessing upon our lives as we receive your word into our hearts now. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I just wanted to go through the Christmas story a little bit found in the book of Luke and help prepare our hearts. We're going to take communion today. We usually do it on Christmas Eve, and we're not going to be able to do that this year, so we're going to do it today. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, and I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version, says this, And in those days it occurred that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole Roman Empire should be registered. And this was the first enrollment, and it was made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. If you study Bible history and you study the time and the era in which Jesus came into this world, you're going to see very quickly that it was a very dangerous time. People were living under a totalitarian government, much like it would have been under communist Russia or China or Korea or even under Nazi Germany. And yet, Scripture tells us in Galatians 4, it said, but when the proper time had fully come, the exact time and the exact moment that God knew to place His Son into the world, it said, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born subject to the regulations of the law, to purchase the freedom of, to ransom, to redeem, to atone for those who were subject to the law, that we might be adopted and have sonship conferred upon us and be recognized as God's sons or children. God picked the exact time, and as I meditated on this scripture, I thought only God would have the audacity to use the IRS to be a part of fulfilling his plan. <laughs> I've often thought Jesus could have come into the world really in our minds, in our hearts, probably at a better time, at a more civilized time, at a more 
gentle time, if you will. But the Bible said at the exact time that God had chosen, he placed Jesus in the world. And that should tell us something about our lives in living in this world. We many times as Christians think, well, if I live for God and I do everything God tells me to do, then somehow everything's always going to work out and everything's going to always be all right and life's going to be easy and things are going to be happy. But even at the birth of Jesus and at the time that God placed him in the world, he was showing us that with great tribulation, with much persecution, with many trials, <laughs> are we going to enter the kingdom of God. This world is not our home. God never intended for you to get comfortable here because you're not going to stay here. And the time you spend here is like a grain of sand on the sea of eternity and the time that it will contain once we are at home with God. In Luke 2, verse 3, it says, And all the people were going to be registered, each to his own city or town. They were being registered so that they could be taxed. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the town of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family, or some of your translations say, of the lineage of David. The religious people of Jesus' day, some 30 years later, as he began to preach and people began to talk about how he spoke with a different kind of authority and a different kind of truth than anybody had ever come before him. The religious leaders would get it wrong. They didn't read their Bibles like a lot of people don't read their Bibles today. And they said, ah, there's no prophet that's coming out of Nazareth. They didn't realize that Jesus hadn't been born in Nazareth where he lived and grew up, but he had actually been born in Bethlehem, the city of David. So, they missed some details. In fact, about 500 years before Jesus' birth, the prophet Micah, he's one of the minor prophets. If you want to know where to read him, pick your Bible up, look at it sideways. It'll be in some of those white pages that you never touch. <laughs> it said, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, you are so little to be among the clans of Judah, yet out of you Shall one come forth from me who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old and from ancient days, even eternity? If you believe that Jesus came into existence when he was born in that manger in Bethlehem, again, you, you neither understand the Scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus said in one place, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Scripture tells us that he is the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. Before this galaxy as we know it, this universe as we know it, this planet as we know it, ever came into existence, God knew his son was going to have to come to earth. He was going to have to suffer and die for you and I. Some people say, well, why in the world did God put that tree in the garden? <laughs> well, to really understand all that, you've got to go way back even before the garden and realize that in the plan of God, there's something about you and I that has to go through this whole process in order to be changed and recreated and made over and to live in eternity with God. We are, if you will, like the caterpillar in the cocoon. We are living our lives, but we are being changed and transformed into something that we cannot dream or really imagine what it's going to be like. And it has taken all of this journey for every man, woman, boy, and girl. And God knew it. When Adam sinned in the garden, when Eve sinned in the garden, God didn't go, oops, that's a mistake. I started with one plan, and they forwarded the plan. He knew before he placed them in there that mankind was going to have to take this whole journey. He knew it in eternity before you were ever created because he is changing us into something that we can't dream or imagine what it's going to be like. Isaiah would talk 
400 years before Christ was born, and he would say these things. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Hundreds of years before Christ was born in Bethlehem, God was preparing the world for the birth of His Son. And not only for His birth, but to give us a promise that He would sit on the throne of David forever and that He would rule the world, that the government would rest on his shoulders. I know over the last, for some of us, it's probably been the last 20 years. For some of you, it's been the last 8 or 10 years. For some of you, it's been the last 4 years. And for some of you, it's just been a couple months. You have grieved and twisted and groaned and moaned over what's happening in our government and who's getting elected and who isn't getting elected. But I want to tell you something. God is on the throne of all governments, all of them. The fellow I voted for, at least so far, hasn't gotten elected, and I doubt very seriously he's going to be elected. But Jesus Christ rules the world. He rules the world, and there are things that are too high for you and I. We don't understand. We don't see. We can't make it add up and put it all together the way we want to do it. It was kind of nice feeling like we were on the winning team for a couple years and that somebody was on our side, right? I played tennis, and I tell the guys I play with, I said, I don't have to win all the time, but I sure hate to lose. (laughs) But I've learned how to be a graceful loser, too. Because the reality is, particularly in life, As we live and walk for God, Jesus is always in charge of what's going on. He is. So, don't grieve and don't groan and don't moan and don't worry about any of it. Don't worry about anything that you can't do anything about anyway. I went to the voting booth. That's all I could do. But the reality is God's in charge. And he knows why. He always knows why. And he's always in control of everything. Jesus Christ rules in this world. And I know that's hard to understand because we want to put one plus one together and make it equal two all the time. And, but I'm telling you, and he's not only ruler in the United States, he's ruler of the world. He has his hand on it all. And that's why his name is called Wonderful. And he's a counselor and a mighty God, eternal father and prince of peace. I love that scripture. It gives Jehovah Witnesses heartburn. See, if you're going to create a false religion, and all false religions are this way, you have to do away with one major thing in the Bible. If you're going to create a new religion that goes contrary to the Bible, Jesus cannot be God. Every false religion. (laughs) And John, in the book of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, talked about it. 2,000 years ago, he said, this is how you recognize everybody that's not of God. They'll deny the Son. They have to. You can't can't twist the book unless you twist that part of it. And Jehovah's Witnesses changed all of that in the New Testament, but they didn't have the light and insight to change the Old Testament. (laughs) When they visit my house, if, if they visit my house, they run from me. They do. If I can get one of them to sit down, I show them in their Bible, which isn't really a Bible, by the way. It's a New World Translation, which really is a New World. It's just a twisted version of our book. And I sit them down and I show them this Scripture because they know that child is Jesus. And then when it starts calling him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, I mean, you know, they get appendicitis just to thinking about it. I said, that's your book. And I think of it every time I read this. It said there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. See, the devil lost at Calvary years ago. He lost. <laughs> he 
He knows he lost. He hates you for it. He hates God for it, but he lost. He absolutely lost. And because of that, there will always be the Son of God sitting on the, over on the throne of David and over David's kingdom, I tell you. Jeremiah, the prophet, said this. He, he said, for this is what the Lord says. David will have a descendant sitting on the throne of Israel forever. And when you go back and you look at Mary and Joseph and you follow their lineage, you're going to find <laughs> they are descendants. In Jeremiah 33, verse 19, it says this, And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there should not be day and night in their season, then you can also break my covenant with my servant, David. <laughs> You're not going to break that. Not till God's ready to deal with it all. He's always going to have someone to sit upon his throne. In Luke 2, 5, it said to be enrolled with Mary, they went to the city of Bethlehem, the city of David. His espoused married wife, who was about to become a mother, and while they were there, the time came for her delivery, and she gave birth to her son, her firstborn, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room or place for them in the end. I thought about that when I walked over and saw that manger setting over there this morning. The audacity of man for the God of the universe <laughs> to come in human form and that of an innocent baby. And we had no room for him right from the very start. And there are many that have no room for him today, in their hearts, in their lives, they're too busy, they're too fixated on things that don't matter and things that one day won't count at all, things that cannot leave this world into the next and focused on, and there's no place for Christ in their lives. But aren't you glad this year that no matter how our Christmas traditions get changed or what we have to do, you cannot take away the Son of God that lives in your heart and that lives in my heart. <laughs> and to know Him, the Son of God, as your Savior, as your Lord, as that shepherd that Brother Steve talked about that loves you more than life itself. Only God would have the audacity to come up with a storyline like that. If you and I wanted to prove to the world that God had taken the form of man and come down to earth, we would have probably written the first Superman story. We would have turned it into a Marvel movie with superheroes and capes and colors because that's how we are. <laughs> but only God would have the audacity to say, I came to earth and this is how I came. I came in the most fragile creature <laughs> that can be birthed into this planet to the lowliest of parents in the lowliest of situations and circumstances. In Isaiah 53, it says this, and it's speaking of Jesus. We often, in our Christmas cards and in our movies and documentaries, we turn Jesus into this beautiful, almost woman-like person with most of the time lily-white skin and, you know, long flowing hair. They came up with that picture when they wrote the King James Bible. That was about the time the musketeers were alive. And so Jesus was a musketeer without the hat. <laughs> but Isaiah says this, he says, who's believed our message? And to whom has the Lord's power or arm been revealed? He grew up in his presence like a young tree, but like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that would make us look at him. He had nothing in his appearance that would make us desire him. He wasn't a happy, shiny, 25-year-old Hollywood star. 
He would have looked like somebody, if he were walking through the crowd, you and I wouldn't even have noticed or paid any attention to. The Lord gave me a vision shortly after I got saved, the only vision I ever had, and I'm not real big on a lot of woo-woo things, but it was real. In that vision, I was behind Jesus. He was hanging on the cross, and all I could see was a silhouette, and I was looking over his left shoulder. But I was looking down into a city who had walls around it, and all I could see was the walls and the roofs of the buildings, round dome buildings, and there was a desert on the other side, and the bluest sky I'd ever seen. But there were crowds of people coming in each direction along the front of this wall, and there was this big gate where they went in. And in this vision, I started crying. It broke my heart because I knew who was hanging on the cross. And as I'm looking down at all these people, nobody is paying any attention to what's going on on this hill. He had no form or comeliness that you and I would desire him. Even in that, he didn't come to entertain our flesh or to draw, draw us to some person, but he came to lead us to the Father and back in a relationship with God. Isaiah went on to say he was despised and rejected by the people. And I've often thought Jesus studied these scriptures. He stood up one day in the temple and actually read out of the scroll of Isaiah, so I know he knew the book. And he learned what would happen in his life, just like you and I would read the book and learn what happened in our lives or what our lives would be. And it says he was despised and rejected by the people. <laughs> he was a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. He not only suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane, he not only suffered on the cross, but he suffered every kind of hurt, every type of pain, every type of loss, every type of loneliness known to mankind. That's what he bore on the cross, but he also grew up as a carpenter's son in a day when they didn't have power tools. And carpenters, even in our day, are very rugged people with very rugged hands and usually spend a lot of time outside and usually have very hardened and rough and rugged skin. And he lived a very hard life. He grew up in a town that was worse than the projects. Somebody said he's from Nazareth. Somebody else said, can any good thing come out of there? You know, that's, that's the hood. That's the ghetto, that's the sticks, that's the project. There ain't nothing coming out of there. I know people wouldn't even talk to him because of where he lived. <laughs> when the Lord gave me that vision, I had sit down on the floor and was praying. I said, God, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what it is. I said, but if there's a power that you can give to people, I want everything you've got, and I want all of it, and I want it now. There were two ladies in the room praying with me, and they said I sat and wept for over an hour. It seemed like two minutes to me. They said, we were getting afraid. We didn't know what was happening to you. But the reality is, when I came out of that vision, and the reason I came out of that vision was is God let me taste just a little bit of all the hurt and the pain and everything else, and the only way I can describe it is you know that gut-wrenching pain when somebody that you love near and dear dies and there's that gut-wrenching pain that you can't do anything about and you can't fix and it's just there and it's just sickening. And that started happening to me because Jesus was bearing every pain, every heartache, every sin, every sickness and disease. And what I, what I heard his thoughts in that vision was this. He could see everything that every human being was going to go through from that moment until the day he came back. And it broke his heart, and it broke mine. And I came out of that vision and said, God, I can't take it. You've got to take this away. I can't stand this. And I came out of that vision because I realized for the first time in my life, he didn't just go as a substitution. He became sin. 
He became sin and disease and sickness and death and everything that every human being, whatever experience went through him in that time and in that moment. And yet he was despised like one from whom people turned their faces and we didn't consider him, the Amplified says, to be worth anything. In that vision, that's what was breaking my heart. Nobody cared. It was just like a Saturday afternoon and people were going to Walmart. They didn't care what was happening on that hill. I couldn't take it, Brother Walt. I couldn't take that. I couldn't take the heartache. I couldn't take the pain. I didn't get baptized in the Holy Ghost that day either. You Be careful when you tell God, God, I want everything you got. Because he might give it to you. And he eventually did give it to me. And you know what he said to me? When, when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I knew what God was saying in that vision. He said, I want to love people through you. But if I do, you're going to hurt like I hurt. That's right. He said, you're going to hurt because they're going to despise you. They're going to reject you. They're going to do all kinds of things. Some of them are going to get saved, but most of them are not. But I want to love them like that through you. That's right. That's really what he wants from all of us, not just me. That's what he wants from all of us. But he gave me that vision that day, and if I die and go to hell, and I'm in hell 10,000 years, you're looking at a person that cannot say, I did not know that God is real, ever. To whom much is given, much is required. In Luke 2, it said, And in that vicinity there were shepherds living out under the open sky in the field, watching in shifts over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord flashed and shone all about them, and they were terribly frightened. I've done a good bit of study, not only about the Christmas story, but the Gospels as well. These weren't just your everyday shepherds. These were shepherds in charge of a walled pen, even though it was out in the country. It was called the Migdal Eater. What it was, it was a pen filled with sheep that were destined to be sacrificed on the Day of Atonement. These are the shepherds that the angels came to. and how appropriate it is. I don't often push things, and I sell very little. <laughs> Pretty good-sized book there. It's called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim, who happens to be a, a Jew, but one who is born again and knows the Lord. That's a big book, and like everything else that's really worth anything in this world, it isn't worth much to the world. You can buy this book, I think, for about 11 bucks if you get online. There are a lot of historians who have written books about the times of Jesus. Even there's a man named Josephus who was not a Christian who lived during the time of Jesus, and a lot of people study him. This man didn't live during the time of Jesus, but he's very familiar with every Jewish tradition, he's very familiar with the land of Israel and the land of Judea and everything around it. If you ever really want to see the Gospels come alive in your Bible, you need to get a hold of this. And I know some of you are looking at it and thinking, man, I'll never read that. Well, you don't necessarily have to read all of it, but you can just read, read the parts of like the Christmas story, for example, if you don't. I have read it a couple times. See all them markers? I've got this thing marked up, notes everywhere. One of the reasons I like it is because you can read each chapter and each section, and when you get to the end of it, you don't have to take some man in history's word for it. You can see it in Scripture. You don't see it before, but when you read a chapter and you go to the chapter after you've read all of the history and the culture and the customs and all the other things, then you can see it in Scripture. See, the Bible is really the only book I really believe anyway. So I encourage you, you know, if you want to get somebody a gift this Christmas, and you might have to wait till after the postal service is about two months behind right now, I think, but uh, on deliveries. But anyway, 11 bucks. Go online. The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And he talks about how these shepherds that were 
shepherding over these lambs that were destined for temple sacrifice, where the very lambs that they were watching over that the angels came to. And how appropriate is that <laughs> at the birth of Christ? In fact, these same lambs, when Jesus is standing before Pilate and Herod and they are testing him and trying him, the priests are over in this corral inspecting these lambs at the same time to make sure they don't have a spot or blemish. God had so loudly proclaimed the gospel to them through every detail, <laughs> if you have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand, but it was unfolding in every way right before their eyes, and yet without spiritual birth, they could not see it. In Luke 2.10, <laughs> I love this verse. It's the first verse of the Bible I ever memorized. As a, I was a child, I was about seven or eight years old, and we were having a Christmas play in church. I only went to church for two years as a child. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's how they told me to say it at seven. <laughs> That's what I love about our children's church. They're over there infecting your kids with the gospel. <laughs> They're going to come out of there seriously infected with a terminal illness that will last forever, hopefully. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Get that word down inside of them. And this will be a sign for you by which you will recognize him. You know, the angels are still talking to the shepherds. They said, you will find after searching a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Swaddling clothes is such a beautiful decorative word. What he was talking about, my mama would have called them rags. Did you grow up with wash rags? My wife thought, she's kind of broke me of that. She said, don't call them rags. I said, well, we called them rags my whole life. <laughs> mama said, get that wash rag over there. Make sure you get behind the mirrors. <laughs> and lying in a manger, a trough, a feeding trough, the God of the universe come down to man, and we put him in a feeding trough, which is better than what we would do later. We'd put him on a stick and stick him back up in God's face and say, we don't want him. <laughs> I'm only saying those things because I want you to understand how far we fell as humankind when we fell in the garden. You look around and see the evil and the hurt and the murder and the abuse, and you say, what in the world's wrong with people? They're sinners. <laughs> we all fell that far in the garden. That's why you're having such a problem getting back on track and following God. We've got a long way to go because he's got to change us to where we don't do these type of things. You do realize the only man-made thing in heaven is going to be the scars in his hands, his feet, and the sword print in his side. Not looking with great anticipation to show up and own up to that. We're going to fall at his feet and worship him because he's worthy. It said, then suddenly there appeared with the angel an army of the troops of heaven, a heavenly knighthood praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased, men of good will and of his favor. That's what I love about God. The world may reject us. The world may put us down, but God will send angels <laughs> to protect us, to take care of us, to let us know how much he loves us. It was almost as if these angels had, were just waiting in attendance for this moment for Jesus to come into the world. And then they rushed in on the scene and they raised those trumpets, which kind of reminds us of the time when Isaiah saw God high and lifted up. He saw Jesus high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and he said, the glory of the Lord filled the earth. And it was a moment just like that. There was a multitude, it said, of the heavenly hosts who started singing a hymn of good tidings and of great joy, and it's 
probably why they looked in shocked horror at the crucifixion and thought, why is he sending us now? Glory to God in the highest and upon earth, peace among men. Good pleasure. Only one other time has those words come, and it was in that vision that Isaiah had. Those very same words came, and, and these shepherds are seeing these angels, and they're hearing these praises of God and the worship that's going on. And, and it says in Luke 2, 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that's come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and by searching, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. How many of you, like me, think they probably went to the best hotel first? Said, nope, not here. (laughs) No baby born here. They said, when they saw it, they made known what had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it were astonished and marveled at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, all this is going on, these shepherds show up. She's just given birth. (laughs) Seen somebody posted a joke, it might have been a man on Facebook yesterday, he said, Mary had just had a baby, she'd just given birth to a baby and somebody came in and said, what? Said they just put Jesus down, got him to sleep, and some little boy come in and said, what this mama needs is a drummer to play a song about now. <laughs> the little drummer boy. <laughs> it said, but Mary was keeping within herself all these things, saying, these sayings, weighing and pondering them in her heart. See you. Uh, Nine months before, the angel Gabriel had appeared to her and said, Mary, you are highly favored and more blessed among women than all women because you're going to give birth to a child. His name will be Jesus, which means Savior of the world. She had been through, by this time, she had been through the shame and disgrace of being pregnant and not being married, of almost losing her fiancé. If the angel hadn't appeared to him, she wouldn't even been married, and they kind of had to leave town and hide away for a little while. She's been through that. You know what? She was as human as you and I are. You know, there are those great high moments when, when God does those awesome things in our lives, and we know right in that moment that it's God, but then the mundane, everyday life starts happening, and sometimes we start wondering, man, I don't know. Was that God? Was it me? What, you know, <laughs> All of that. And here she is, doesn't really even have a place of her own to live, not really probably a lot of clothes to wear. She's wrapped her baby in rags and had to lay it in a straw in a manger. You know, a lot of people today have abortions because they don't know how they're going to support a hand to a child. What do you think Mary thought? (laughs) She said, I'm married to a guy that wasn't all that sure he wanted to be married to me. I just had a baby that's supposed to be the savior of the world, and here I am in a cave, and the baby's been born, and I've got nothing but rags, and I'm wrapping. You know, all those things had to be going through her mind. But she also, I believe, pondered what the angel Gabriel had announced to her. As she stood at the foot of the cross, Mary and Mary alone knew all these conversations. You think this night of all nights, this holy night when Jesus was born, you think her mind didn't go back to that and see every moment and every second of it as her son hung there dying for the sins of the world. I believe she also remembered what Simeon the priest had said to her when she had taken Jesus eight days later back to the temple and 
In Luke 2.34, it said, Simeon, the priest, blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Thank God he left the 99, and he came after you, and he came after me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I was falling. I was falling when he found me, and I was destined to fall except for his love and his hand to reach down and to lift our lives out of the pit and out of the mire and out of the disgust of this world and put us next to his heart. He is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. You know, it's just probably been in the last two or three years that, I mean, the world has never like Christ. The world has never really accepted who and what he is, but just the vehement hatred that is starting to be thrown his way again tells me we've got to be getting near the end. And he, Simeon said to her, he said, yes, and a sword is going to pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I know sometimes when you're going through things, you know that God's going to get you through. You just wish he didn't trust you so much. But just think what kind of trust and faith that God put in this little teenager. He put the destiny of mankind in her womb. And thank God he put his spirit in her heart to give her the strength and grace to endure it all. Jesus would say, no greater love hath any man than this, than he would lay down his life for his friend. I think there's one greater. It's the love of a mother who would be willing to lay down life for her son. For you and for me, that's what God did for us. And that's what Christmas is really about. That's what that gift really is. So I don't know how you think about Christmas, but you need to think about a mom who gave up her child, her firstborn, not her only, but her firstborn. She also gave him up. The Father in heaven gave him up. He had to turn, the Bible said. The curtain of heaven was pulled shut because he could not look on his son. That's why Jesus cried out, Father, why, oh why? Have you forsaken me? Because he took on your sin and my sin so we could be forgiven and become sons and daughters of God. That is the gift of Christmas. And then finally in Luke 2.20 it said, In the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen just as it had been told them. It's the greatest story that's ever been told about the greatest gift that's ever been given through the life and death of the greatest person that has ever graced this planet. Amen? He is a life changer. He is a life saver. He is a redeemer. He is someone, though your sins be as scarlet, can wash you white as snow. And all you need to do is call on him, give your heart and life to him, and follow him. Amen. Because he's coming back for us one day. <laughs> We're going to have a Christmas like no other one of these days. Amen. Going to ask the worship team to come to the platform if you would. Going to ask those of you that are going to serve communion if you would come and get the communion elements. They're going to pass them out to you. We've got some new little cups. The wafer's on the top and the juice is on the bottom. They're on two different ends. Make sure it's a little easier for you, a little safer for you, and at the same time, be easier to keep from spilling it. Man, I need a tissue. Who's got it? Here we are. Thanks, sir. 
I know I get a little emotional about things, but he is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. Amen. <laughs> and you too. Why don't you stand up this time? We're going to sing a hymn while they're passing these out. You'll peel off we'll that little tab on top. There's a little unleavened wafer there. Scripture tells us that the same night that Jesus was betrayed that he took this unleavened bread and after he'd given thanks, he broke it. I don't know where we're going to be able to break it. We might just have to eat this. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but he said, this is my body which is given for you. He knew when he came into the world, when he got old enough to realize what his mission was, that God had prepared a body it would be offered up for the sins of the world, for your sins and for my sins. And there is a moment, a place in time where you know that you turn from darkness to light, from death to life, from sin and unrighteousness and disobedience to a heart that said, God, I want to do nothing but please you with the rest of my life. Amen. And that made his sacrifice of his body on the cross worth it all, to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads and let's pray over this bread and then we'll take it together. We want to say Merry Christmas to you, Father. We want to say thank you to you, Jesus. Not only our sacrifice and our offering, but our great high priest that ever lives and is seated at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. Lord, you came and you showed us the way and the way we know because you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for coming to empower us because of that sacrifice, to enable us to say yes and amen to all the promises and goodness of God. And Lord, so we come and we thank you for this greatest of all gifts here at Christmas time. Father, we receive this bread and we receive this life. You said no man can follow you and no man can be a disciple except to eat of your flesh and drink of your blood. And this is what you meant. So Lord, we ask that you would bless it, that you would hallow it. We dedicate our hearts, our lives, our energy, our resources, everything that we are we lay them at the foot of the cross and offer them to you as a gift in return. For your children are our heritage, a reward of the Lord. And we take it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take it. Ironically, it looks like a little hourglass, doesn't it? <laughs> if you'll be careful and just peel that back gently, we're going to pray over it too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I remember the moment and the hour of that vision. God, it's as real to me today as it was 40 years ago. And I know and believe that thou art the Christ. I know and believe in my heart that you took on the pain, the hurt, the sickness, the disease, the hatred, everything that the curse has brought upon this fallen world. You bore that on the cross. You who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in you. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. We thank you, Son, for the gift of your life. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the gift of his life in us, whereby we are saved. Lord, we lift up this cup which is symbolic of the blood that was poured out, the sacrifice that was made, of the cleansing that could come. That, Lord, as you said, those that are hungry and thirsty can come and with no money and receive the gift of eternal life. 
those that were guilty and children of hell would be forgiven and cleansed and washed and healed and made in your image to shine, Father. And Lord, we thank you for the Son. Let's take the cup together. And I just want to thank you, each person, for showing up and making this service so special. To place God at the center of our hearts and our life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have looked at your word, your scripture, about the greatest love story ever told. That the God of the universe would send his only son down to earth in the form of a baby in the direst and unlikely situation as born in a trough in a manger wrapped in rags Father God all because you loved us and you desire for each person to come to you through this little baby Jesus we were so thankful that he lived a perfect life, that he bore the cross, endured the death that, that we cannot fathom or understand. And Lord, we're grateful that the grave could not hold him, and that you, we have victory over death through your son Jesus. Amen. Father God, just... I lift each person up to you today that we reflect to best of our ability to comprehend the love you have for us. In the midst of our sinfulness and our disobedience, you still love us. Do you still desire to have a relationship with us? Father God, help us to humble ourselves before you today, I pray. Father God, I just pray, Lord, that each person share this love story. Yes. The great love that you have for each person, sinner and saved alike. That you desire for each person to have a relationship with you. So, Father God, I pray for boldness. I pray for the moving of the Holy Spirit in our lives, Father God, that we have love and compassion for our fellow man. And yes, Father God, love for our enemies, those who mistreat us and despise us. Help us to love them, Father God, like you loved us when we were in the same state. So, Father God, come. Holy Spirit, come live and breathe in us, God, our footsteps, God, our actions, and Lord, help us to fill our lips with your praise and to honor you with everything we say and do. Lord, just be with us now in this coming week. Just guide us and direct us in everything we say and do. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, new life. I love you. You have a blessed Christmas. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn. Join the world.